When I was a full-time commodity cowboy, all I thought about was how many pounds of beef I could squeeze out of this farm at the lowest possible price, with no real focus except pounds of beef and how cheap I could do it. Today, I never ever think about how many pounds we can sell. What I think about all day, every day is, how can I make this land better? What if I put compost this way? What if I put a cover crop that way? What if I graze it in a different way? What can I do to make that happen? We're standing here on my farm in the edge of Bluffton, Georgia. It's one of the poorest counties in the nation. Wonderful land, wonderful climate, and poor people. The census says there are 102 people. We can't count but about 50. The only thing you can buy in Bluffton is a stamp if you get there between 8 and 12 during the week. If you need a gallon of milk or a tube of toothpaste, it's 12 miles to the store. And what happened to Bluffton is what happened to so many small rural towns that had a purely agrarian economy. With the centralization of industrial agriculture, it simply wasn't needed anymore. There was no economic reason for this town to be here, so people moved to places where they could get better jobs. From here, I can see a dozen of these old stores in Bluffton. Mr. Greer Matsfield had a store right here, General Merchandise, and Mr. Herman Bass had a store here, about an eight-foot alley between them. And I remember my mother going in and uh, Mr. Herman saying, well, you must have not got what you wanted at Grills. I see you swimming there first. They're very competitive. As far as the impoverishment of rural America, nobody of my father's generation said, Let's just suck all the money out of this little town and let it dry up and blow away. That never happened. My father told me that in 1946, a salesman invited all the farmers to a fish fry. And he brought 200 pound bags of ammonium nitrate fertilizer with him. And his ask was, get out in your pasture, put it down in a pattern, and leave it for three days and come back and look at it. And when my father came back, you know, the grass was this much higher than the other grass. You know what he said? He said, shit, I want my whole farm to look like that. And we put nitrogen fertilizer on every acre of our land every year from 1946 when he was doing it until 1995. What we couldn't see is that that ammonium nitrate fertilizer killed the microbial life that fed the soil. It was an unintended consequence. I went to the University of Georgia and majored in animal husbandry. It became animal science, and it was very industrial cattle farming. And I came back and did that for about 20 years and was good at it. But every year, I liked what I was doing a little bit less. The industrialization of agriculture sought to make this farm a factory. Nobody sane and normal should enjoy watching a cow in a feedlot or a hog in a gestation crate or a chicken in a battery cage. And I came to hear about consumers that wanted grass-fed beef. And it appealed to me. And I started slowly changing my production practices. And the first thing that I did was give up confinement feeding of corn. I gave up uh, sub-therapeutic antibiotics, and I gave up uh, hormone implants. And that was all I ever really intended to do. And then decided that using chemical fertilizers and pesticides on the pastures was as wrong as using hormone implants and sub-therapeutic antibiotics. That's my daddy, Will Bell Harris. I was taken at my wedding. The only time a flower ever got put on his lapel. <laughs> my daddy talked more like foghorn leghorn than I do. 
and my father was not involved in me changing this farm from an industrial farm to what it is today. He died of dementia, and uh, I didn't start the process until about 1995, so we didn't have to have that discussion. Uh, he would have been opposed to that, and rightfully so. We made money every year. Never lost money, ever. Come on, up. There were many, many times that I woke up and said, what in the hell was I thinking? Because we went from no debt to borrowing seven and a half million dollars to build processing plants and operating for a number of years in which I literally lost money every year. You know, I didn't know if I was going to lose the farm that my great granddaddy had established 130 years earlier, the farm that I was supposed to leave for my children and put my wife in a position where she could have died in a rented mobile home somewhere. And those were dark days. I'd work till dark. I'd go in, I'd drink a bottle, a bottle and a half of wine. I'd go to sleep. About two o'clock, I'd burn through the wine. I'd get up, go to the bathroom, make coffee, put my boots on and go again. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we took incredible risk. Today, I'm very glad that I made the changes that I made because the farm is again profitable and cash flow positive. And two of my daughters and their spouses have come back to work on the farm. And at least that last part probably wouldn't have happened under the other scenario. I used to consider what I did to be a very simple business. I had nothing but cattle, dogs and horses to work the cattle, cowboys to work the dogs and horses. We raised the cows, we fed corn to the cows, we sold the live cows. It's a pretty simple business. And then I got into an even more simple business. Today, we don't feed animals, we feed the microbes in the soil. The microbes feed the soil, and the soils feed the plants, and the plants feed the animals, and they breed, and they grow, and we turn them into meat and sell it for money, which is like the blood that pumps through our bodies to keep it all going. And it's really a beautiful system. And what's most beautiful is that every generation, the animals are healthier and healthier, happier and happier. You know, my daughter had really been after me to bring sheep in. I think oh, she thought they were cute, but I brought them in because we desperately needed them. There's a lot of symbiosis, a lot of synergy that comes from having cattle and small ruminants in a polyculture together. The internal parasite that affects cattle most are brown stomach worms. Sheep don't care about brown stomach worms. The internal parasite that affects sheep most are barber pole worms. Cattle don't care about barber pole worms. So if you've got the two species out here together, like these are, it's like a dead end street with the life cycle of the brown stomach worms and the sheep and the barber pole worms and the cattle. I don't know why any serious cattleman in this country wouldn't have some small ruminants out there with them. It's, it's, it's profitable. So this is a pasture that has been grazed off real short, and they got poultry is out there now. They're out here in the pastures in these houses. There's nothing constraining them at all. They could walk from here to Atlanta if they wanted to. Those houses are portable. We move them once a week to give them an area that's free of pathogens and parasites so they stay healthier. Another reason is to move that chicken manure around. If chicken manure is all concentrated in one place, it's toxic. But if it's moved around, then it's, it's feed for the microbes in the soil. Horn flies and face flies, which are pests for cattle, lay eggs in the manure. Chickens scratch in the manure and eat the larva and it's feed for the chickens and it breaks the life cycle of the pest for the cattle. So it's a great example of symbiosis.
Prior to about 1995, we had about 700 cows and we sold the calves fairly soon after weaning. Since then, we've increased the carrying capacity dramatically. We've still got about 700 mama cows and we have about 1,000 goats, about 1,000 ewes, about 100 sows, and then the poultry, chickens, turkeys, geese, guineas, and ducks. There's about 100,000 beating hearts on this farm on any given day. Our pastures are better than they've ever been because we don't till them up, we don't use chemical fertilizer, we don't use pesticide. It's more teeming with life, there's more nutrient density. The organic matter in our pastures has gone from less than a half a percent to over five percent over about 15 years. We had never seen a bald eagle on this farm until about five years ago. Bald eagle, look at it. And today we have 26 that live on the farm. The Department of Natural Resources says this is the largest eagle population in Georgia. It's a sign of the ecological health of this farm. You know, I'm different from most of the people that I know in this sustainable, humane food movement in that I am one of the good old boys that produced food industrially, and then I went commando. And I still talk to those people. They're still my friends. And one of the things that they say is, well, I mean, what you're doing is fine, Will, but you can't feed the world like that. And my response is, I don't know that I'm supposed to feed the world. I think I'm supposed to feed my community. We have about 120 employees. We're the largest private employer in any of these counties around here. We have bought a number of houses and storefronts and lots in Bluffton. About 10 of these houses we've renovated for the purpose of employee lodging. These next three houses belong to me. I've got my livestock manager and farm events manager live in that house. My organic farm manager and his wife live in that house. And my poultry manager and his wife live in that house. So John Muir has told us that in nature, when you pull a string, you see that everything is connected. There's no reason to believe that the health of the soil is not connected to the health of the community. In rebuilding the soil, we are rebuilding a farmer middle class. Just about everything I see makes me feel good. It makes me feel good to see these eagles flying across. It makes me feel good to see the squirrels playing in the trees. It makes me feel good to see all these animals, both wildlife and farm animals, expressing instinctive behaviors. I think it's healthy for me and my family and my employees and my customers to eat food that's raised like this. It is food as nature intended food to be. You know, the expression is, I get paid for what I was made for. Technically, I work 16 hours a day, because 16 hours a day, I'm on this farm, I'm if I'm not physically on it, I'm thinking about it, but I don't feel like I work at all. I, I, I would do for free what I do for a living. I'm not preaching too much, but I'm just preaching off. I mean, I'm just fucking telling you. You're preaching. I'm fucking. This is my church. <laughs>